but I needed to drive it around the, the race Bronco around because we needed wheels to, to get parts and all around that. Right. I was so shocked that in race trim, I had no windshield on it, just a little wind deflector with foolish pleasure on, written on it that I called it. <laughs> the racing harnesses, all the everything else, window nets, we'll have to take them off so we could use it. And the three of us, my wife sitting in between myself and my brother-in-law on a pillow. And we drove it around. We went through the McDonald's drive through even passed a couple <laughs> of police officers, never got pulled over. Are you into four-wheeling, camping, and exploring? How about off-road racing like mud bogs, short course, wheel-to-wheel racing, or even desert races? Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome to 4 Before Canada podcast. My name is Wes, and I've been four-wheeling since I was six weeks old. I have over 20 years' experience in 4 Before shops, many more than that in the off-road racing, and a lifetime of exploring the backcountry across Canada. Every week, we bring you a new guest where they give you their perspective on the industry. We discuss everything from four-wheeling, overlanding, every form of off-road racing across this great country as well as we talk to many canadian manufacturers and four before shops just a quick reminder that if you're looking for more episodes you can find all of our episodes on four before canada podcast.com or your favorite podcast sharing platform you can find us on facebook instagram and youtube at four before canada podcast.com now let's get to the show hey everybody i'm your host wes and I am Trisha. Nice to meet you, everyone. And my name is Rory Brown. I'm the guest tonight, and I'm more than happy to be with the two. It's awesome. I've really been looking forward to this, Rory. Welcome to the 4 Before Canada podcast. It's something that you and I have been going back and forth, and I've been really looking forward to this interview tonight. So before we get too deep, I just want to ask our listeners for a quick favor. If you enjoy the 4 Before Canada podcast and you get value from it, please share it with your friends or some of you think that will enjoy it as well. I also want to mention those that know me are aware that I love history and the vintage stuff. If you're interested in this also, I recommend checking out two of my groups on Facebook. The Vintage World Drive Canada group is a place for people to talk about and share photos about four-wheeling years ago. It's also a great spot for owners of vintage 4 before to share information and show off their rigs. And the Off-Road Race Canada history group is full of great photos and videos of all forms of off-road racing across Canada from before 2000. So two really good groups that I find quite entertaining. So tonight we're talking with Rory Brown from Vancouver Island. He was involved in the four-wheel drive scene from the 70s into the 90s. And off-air, you mentioned that you kind of got hooked on four-wheeling when you were out hunting as a teenager. Yeah, that, that's correct, Wes. My parents owned the campground at French Creek, which is a, a small boat harbor or halfway in between Parksville and Qualcomm. They owned, had owned the property for quite a while, got to know some of the, uh, the local fishermen, the commercial guys. One of them they became pretty good friends with. He was really into corn binders, international harvesters, and he owned a, a Scout 800, which is one of the very first ones that they came out with. Small little pickup truck, rode like a tank, little four-cylinder, not, not a lot of power. But he was also into hunting. Uh, my, my dad was trying to get us interested in that aspect of outdoors and asked this gentleman to take us along on a few hunting trips that were locally around in the Park Soul Qualcomm area. And from that point, piqued my interest in four-wheel drives because up until then, they were just riding little mini bikes around in the bush and stuff like that. But <laughs> where that scout could go certainly opened my eyes about how rough a road could be and still you could drive over it, right? So yeah, exactly. that, that was my start. And then you also mentioned that your first off-road capable vehicle was actually not a 4 before, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't. I kind of went behind my, my dad's back and I paid for that for a little bit. There was a... a fiberglass Volkswagen dune buggy for sale close to where we lived in French Creek. And it was really cheap. And for the allowance that I had collected over the years, I had enough to go and buy it. Uh, But I wasn't brave enough to bring it home for (laughs) right away. So uh, the cool thing about it was it had a bus transaxle in it. And I don't know if you know the, the buses of that, the Volkswagen buses had a gear reduction on the end of the axles, much like the, yeah, the Unimox. Unimox. Unimox, yeah. And this, the particular owner who converted it did a really good job by laying the, the offset like horizontal rather than vertical. So 
the dune buggy actually drove really good and, and was pretty pretty level, right? If you if you see something like a buggy or a VW with the bus transaxles and that hasn't been done, the back end really sticks up high. So brought it home, got kind of here's my driver's license, Dad, you can keep it for a couple of months. <laughs> But after that penalty was over, I used it for a couple of years driving around the logging areas close to where we lived. It was great to get out. The gearing was just neat enough to get down most of the forest service roads. It was by no means capable to go up. Something had been washed out or anything, but I had a lot of fun driving it around. And when I sold it for a profit, dad was pleased. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> they're, they're actually not bad vehicles off-road especially with that gearbox the bus gearbox mm-hmm. they're actually mm-hmm. you know kind of capable just because they're so light right yep. and you got the you know did you have the turning brakes in it no i didn't okay no i didn't yeah. there was a few people that can't used to come to our campground and a couple of them had tube chassis buggies right with yep. with that kind of arrangement on them and had a couple of rides one of them had a 2180 cc uh diversion like a big board kit in it and it flew <laughs> yeah they, they moved pretty good so, yep. so let's get into the four by fours. You were a Bronco man, and yeah, you know uh, that primarily because I had been around short wheelbase vehicles for four wheel drives. I told my friends had Jeeps and Land Cruisers, and had gone off with them off road. But being a Ford guy, the only alternative to that was a Bronco, right? <laughs> so, yeah, my first purchase was a an early Bronco six cylinder, three on the tree. 170 cubic inches of of not a lot of power and it came with a soft top and a roll bar along with the the hard the hard top and i had a lot of fun with it i bought it primarily for skiing because at that time i was into skiing uh big time and i was getting tired of putting chains on all these guys would get out turn the hubs and go (laughs) well i'm under (laughs) the mud put the chains on so that was the primary reason that i bought it Unfortunately, I only owned it for a couple of years because a couple of winters later, I hit some black ice and, and flipped it on its roof, which is pretty common with the early Broncos because of the coil springs. They get a little sideways, that coil spring sinks so fast, it just kind of flips it onto the roof. There was no sign of a rollover on the other side, but the, the roof and the, the front of the hood was mashed pretty good. I had some really cheap ski carriers, thankfully. And it was so violent on the rollover that it threw the skis off the truck. And they just got banged up a little bit. They could have been in pieces if they had been stuck on the roofs. That was the end of that one. But it got me into the four-wheeling with the sidewinders. Because come summertime, I wanted to do more with it. So my friends had four-wheel. And a person I knew in high school, Randy Jenkins, was a member of the sidewinders. And from that, he got me into the club. Yeah, yeah, Randy Jenk is that name's ringing a bell. I think I've seen it bouncing around a few times over the years. So the not the 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 Nanaimo Sidewinders Club. Now, from my understanding, that started in '75, and they became a member of the Four Drive Association in '76, '77 when the association formed. Now, back then, the clubs were very typical. A lot of monthly club runs and very family oriented from what I do remember as a kid. They also did some racing and stuff like that. So after you rolled that Bronco, that was back, what, 78, 79? Something around there, yeah. Yeah. So you rolled the Bronco. What did you get into next? Let's see. I'll have to check my notes here. (laughs) (laughs) Not a problem. I think that was your 69 F-250. Oh, yes. I, I, I bought it because it was for sale locally. It was a company truck. An HVAC company had used it. It was right in my price range, meaning it was cheap. <laughs> so it was my first foray into something that was long wheelbase. It was bone, stock, standard, everything. No power brakes, no power steering, <laughs> closed knuckle front end. So it had the seals. I got really good at replacing them because yep. they, they would not last very long. I mean, it was a high boy, had the remote transfer case. And I actually four-wheeled it a lot with the club. Entered a couple of Van Isle 200s with it. My wife, Jean, was pregnant on one of those trips, and she survived the whole thing. I, I got quite a few, through a few winch, oh, most of the, the, all of the winch points that were off, surprised the heck out of the guys who were manning it. Oh, that's never going to get up here. Oh, yeah, just watch me. <laughs> yeah. And then I bought a camper to go along with that. 
I was in the trades and needed a place to stay when I was down in Victoria taking my year apprenticeship training for electric. So both of them fit well with what I was doing at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then you also mentioned earlier off air that in 1980, you picked up a, another Bronco that you used for racing. Let's talk about that Bronco. And then I want to get into the racing back then, which is quite different than well, what there is now. Sure. So there was a few members in our club that, that raced. It was actually Randy Jenkins again that gave me the bug for that. He, and this is maybe where you remember, I sent a picture to one of your, your websites, racing website of, of his Ram charger. He was into Dodges at the time. He had this Ram charger with a big block in it. He and I are sitting on the line and Rick Rayner is sitting, leaning on the truck at the, at the waiting for it to go in the pit at the race in Campbell River. Yep. So that one lap with that pretty much put the bug into, hey, I really want to try this. And realize that, first of all, an FT50 is not really good to go. And, and secondly, you don't really want to beat the crap out of the truck that you want to drive on the street. Yeah. Because you don't want to be pick, trying to fix it on Sunday night so you can get, get to work on Monday morning. <laughs> so uh, there was another member, and I talked to him and kind of made an arrangement that if I found something, possibly would he go together with us and, and, and buy it, and we'd race it together, much like a, a, a couple of our, well, a few members did in, in the club. Yeah. I was going to trade school again and drove by this 69 that was parked in the front yard under a cedar tree. It had been there for a long time. I could tell it was just, you know, it had the green gun genre and, <laughs> and, and stacks of old cedar boughs sitting like uh, piled all over it. Mm -hmm. Drove past it two or three times that particular year down there, the two months I was down there. And <laughs> finally stopped and said, hey, do you want to sell it? And my timing was perfect because he had just been contemplating about, about doing that exact thing. Nice. Uh, he said, yeah, sure. You can have it for 1200 bucks. And I said, okay, perfect. I got a partner. I'm going to go check to see if that's what he wants to do. He unfortunately said, no, nah, I, I can't afford to do it right now. But I was really hooked. So I had to have it. Scraped the $1,200 up, went down and uh, to pick it up. And he said, oh, it comes with a few spare parts. Boy, did it ever. Had a spare body from the firewall back, oh. a couple of spare doors, brand new gear set for the Dana 30 front end. The truck was complete, although it was standard steering and Dana 30 front end and stuff. I shouldn't say standard steering, it's standard brakes, three on the tree, Dana 30 front end. It did have a power steering unit. And back then, one of the popular little fixes for non-power steering Broncos was taking the box out of an early T-Bird and okay. placing it in on. It, it's a weird setup. It sits high off the frame, the, the box. It sits on the outside of the frame, so you have to have the steering column kind of do a shimmy to the left to get out to it. But it drove really nice, and it was way quicker than a truck a box. So carted that all home and started working on it right away. Sold a lot of parts to help finance the, the thing. It was a problem getting on the trailer it wouldn't go in neutral i had to put the transfer case in neutral so i'll push it up on the truck of course i hadn't run for years got it running in the two-wheel drive or within the transfer case in neutral and realized that the clutch disc had frozen to the the plate so rather than take it apart i backyard fixed it shade tree fixed it got the 289 fix running jacked it up in the back end of the truck up put the transfer case in two-wheel drive, had my brother sit in it, and I kicked it off of the, uh, the jack stand. First time it stalled. Second time we did it, he revved it up and pushed it. I pushed it off, and it, it let go with a pretty good bang, but it was free. <laughs> it chattered for a while, but after driving on the road for a while and getting it broke back into functioning fine, I never had a problem with it racing or anything like that. So it yeah. had a lot of fun. My brother helped build a roll cage for it. He's a heavy duty mechanical welder. I found a couple of seats from a Mustang high back. I had an upholster friend of mine I modify them with the hole through the back to for the harnesses. And he did a tunnel cover for the back of it and the roof. And I bought some desert dogs and scabbed enough rims together to put, put the desert dogs on there. And in the end, I had probably 1500 bucks into it after making the money back on the parts and I had a, a lot of fun racing. 
for two years before I finally mm-hmm. blew the front end up. <laughs> so let, let, let's go back to the Desert Dogs. Desert Dogs were the tire back they in were. the late, late 70s, early 80s. They were yeah. the tire. And yeah. were yours the, the X style? No, just or, a standard. Or the, the, the standard. wave? Yeah, the, the standard wave. Nice soft tire, worked great in the dirt. You didn't dare drive them more than about five miles on pavement because they would wear out <laughs> the faster than you would know. Except I did end up driving on the pavement with it because I had it licensed. We were going up to Kamloops for a race and I was toying with the 69, uh, the camper and all that. And uh, coming into Penticton, I could hear a squeak. So I gone, okay, what is that? Finally figured out that the front bearing had died. So limped it into Penticton, went to a, a campground there, asked, hey, explained I had a problem with the front end. Would they mind if I did a repair? It was fairly early in the year, so they had no problem. But I needed to drive it around the, the race bronco around because we needed wheels to, to get parts and all around that. Right. I was so shocked that in race trim, I had no windshield on it, just a little wind deflector with foolish pleasure on, written on it that I called it. <laughs> The racing harnesses, all the, everything else, window nets, we'll have to take them off so we could use it. And the three of us, my wife sitting in between myself and my brother-in-law on a pillow. And we drove it around. We went through the McDonald's drive through We passed a couple of police <laughs> officers, never got pulled over. Of course, these days, you'd ne- that would never happen, right? So Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. The other tire back in that era was the Terra tires. Yep. And I yeah. borrowed a couple of, of them off of uh, either Greg and Greg or Rick and Bruce and, and had them with us when we went to, to Kamloops because I used them when I raced the obstacle and did the hill yep. climb with it. That yeah, sort of that, that was a big combination. Tez, Desert Dogs in front and Terra Tires in the back. Yeah. And for, for those of you who don't know what the Terra Tires are, they're basically a wide, I think they're like a 31 by 15 and a half or something like that. 15 tire and with basically a zigzag you know across yep. and yep. they originally were used on some of the implements or yep. weren't they farm sure they were farm they were a farm tire they even said not dot approved on it <laughs> I, and I, i'm not sure if any police officer ever caught on to that because there was a few people who would run them on the street right but again yeah. they didn't want to do it too long because they'd wear out really really fast Exactly. Yeah. 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 And now, like I say, that was, a, that was the combination, you know, Desert Dogs 31 by 1050 on, on the fronts and yeah, 31 by 1550 Terra tires on the back. Yeah. And with the racing back in the, you know, seventies and into the eighties, back then they're called basically play days. And it was a combination of different events. You had the sand drags, which, you know, you're racing against somebody else. The hill climb, which you're racing by yourself up a steep hill, and whoever got the best time up would win. The obstacle course, usually one vehicle at a time around a rough course. For our listeners, can you explain what the team relay was? So a team relay progressed from obstacle racing. It was probably a precursor to wheel-to-wheel, like what you see today. And wheel-to-wheel was just starting to occur back then, but it wasn't very popular because you're beating and bashing on your trucks and having to replace a lot of stuff usually after that. So a team relay was a set of four trucks. It was on generally set up on the same obstacle course that you had competed singly on. They would put between two and four gates, sometimes three. They could, it all depended on, on the layout, but at minimum two, maximum usually four. The teams would get together. They would, uh, the start gate would be set to go the, towards the direction that everyone was going to go around. They would go bumper to bumper in line. The, everybody would, uh, the, there was a flagger on each gate. They were looking at usually a, generally a flagger in the middle of the course. When he raised his flag or she raised his flag, everybody raised the flag and the race was off. So the first vehicle would go and go, go around and the, the line would move. And then the way the finish gate was, it, it was, right in front of the next vehicle to go so that there was no chance of jumping. The vehicle had to clear the start gate before the next truck or vehicle, SUV, whatever, could go. And everybody would do the rounds until the, the final truck came in. And then they, when it was finished, when that 
last vehicle cleared the finish gate, the flag starter would raise the flag that that team would finish. And there would be four people watching the, that the guy would, would stop watches and that's how they would time the race. So, and generally it was a, a ladder was built and they would take the, depending on how much racing you wanted to do, they would either take the one team from say four or five combinations or a couple of teams. If there was only, you know, enough for maybe two races and then they would race again, do the same thing over again. So it was actually so basically easy. there's, there's two to four vehicles on the track at all one time, but they're yep. spread out enough that they are, that they're going around. So yep. as you come off, say your first driver, you pull off and your guy that on your team would be hit the hammer, he'd be out. And then same thing until all four vehicles in on your team are done. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. You still have to be careful because sometimes maybe another vehicle from another team is having a little difficulty and hasn't quite got past your start gate. So you had to it wasn't just watching your guy. You also had to make sure or be aware of the locations of all the uh, trucks on the, the course at the time. And was what, were you allowed to, like, obviously you want to race with your buddies on your team kind of idea. Yep. Did they have any rules? Like you had to have a stock vehicle and then a modified vehicle or you just run? No, it just, you and your buddies? just run whatever you could put in. In Kamloops, team got put together and they, I was the only one from the Sidewinder. So I just put my name in, in a hat. And there was two four-wheel drives, I think uh, my Bronco, a Jeep, and two buggies. So it, it didn't matter uh, really of what type of vehicles. In the end, they all kind of balanced out, right? There was never any huge, like big horsepower didn't necessarily give you a big advantage, right? So, Yeah, especially on some of those tight courses, right? So, yeah. yeah. Or the mud or, or whatever. The, you know. yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. The And then the barrel races. That was another fun event that that you guys had. And it's the same idea that you see barrel racing with horses, but yep. you're doing it with a, a Jeep yep. or a Bronco or a, a buggy or whatever. And, but you just got to be careful because there's those grooves. Every time you go around the barrels, the grooves are getting deeper. So there's a few yep. rollovers I remember. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That or clipping the barrel. Same. You go around them the same direction as the horse racers doing the horse racing and stuff. So. It's not the only event that is, is based on agriculture that four-wheel drives would do. And we'll get into discussing some of the other events so that was created just for fun, right? So Yeah, we'll, yeah, definitely. That'll be the next. But out of these regular events that you'd see at pretty much every race, what was your favorite? I had fun doing all of them. I raced all of them at, at one point or, or another. I'd have to say the team really was the fun, most fun. But I'm a drag racer too, so I enjoyed drag racing. I like obstacles or racing because it was still based kind of on the on the team relay. But the the team relay was a team, right? So you could be pretty successful if you had a bit of an off lap. The rest of the team could pick it up, and still you'd still move on to the next yep. round, right? So yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it uh, yeah it, it definitely fun, and and they still do the team relay over at the races in Port Alberni. Really? On the island, oh, good. yeah, yeah, good. the uh, the Island Off Road Racing Association, which you know, I'll throw another plug into them. They have some great racing, or they got the wheel to wheel. They've got sand drags, they've got mud drags, and they have the obstacle course. But the team relay is still one of the key events over there, and it's just such a fun, fun event, right? Yeah, so, I, I, I raced in that pit a few times before it really got organized as, as the way it is now. Yeah, and stuff. I had a lot of fun there. I've got pictures of one of my daughters sleeping in my arms along the edge of the, the pit while there's uh, open headers running behind it. <laughs> and, and I saw Subaru Brat race the course there, which was very <laughs> weird because it's hardly an exhaust. And here's a stock vehicle whipping it around and he was beating the heck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Subaru Rat back in that era, that was a Subaru, like a car basically, but it was a little pickup. And it's just something you didn't see very with two, often. With right? two, two little jump seats in the back, right? Facing right. <laughs> backwards with, with little handles to hold on. I'm sure really legal and safe in a car accident. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they didn't do much safety testing on that one. No, no. <laughs> so some of the other events, there, there's a lot of fun events at these play days. And there is the blindfold obstacle, which is also known as the divorce race. And I'll get into that. Yeah, the the egg carry, the stone boat, the teeter totter, 
the kids obstacle. I really remember the kids obstacle and I've got lots of pictures with me and my dad and be sitting on my dad's lap and he'd operate the pedals and the shifter and I would operate the string wheel. So here I am, you know, five years old or seven years old or 12 years old, and then eventually moving into where I can do the pedals by myself and stuff like that. And you, you get these little twin, tiny trophies and it was just, that totally made the weekend for us kids, right? Yeah, so Yeah, I, I got pictures of Daryl and it, with his son Warren on his lap at uh, a race in Mount Nair in Nanaimo here. So, yeah. Yep, yep. yeah, that was just, you know, and that goes back to the whole event being a family, family event, right? Yep. I mean, there are some, you know, from some of the stories I've heard, there's some pretty good drinking on the Saturday night, but. Rumors, complete rumors. rumors. <laughs> no pictures, no cameras. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have the cameras no back. Yeah. You didn't have the cell phones back then, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it was, you know, really a, a family event back then. So maybe if you can explain to our listeners, and, and Trisha, I think some of these ideas would be really neat for the events that you do with your your, your GTA Jeep girls and, and other events that you guys do out there. Like the blindfold driver is a... Well, like I say, it's called the divorce race. And yeah. uh, so basically the, the driver is blindfolded, as you can imagine, and the passenger is giving them directions. Oh and God. I've done these before in the past, and I've found that you got to go my way, your way. That's the way you got to communicate instead of this way and that way. And you're trying, right. you're pointing. So obviously the person can't see you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a lot of that. And then there's, uh, as, as you said. Sometimes the interaction between the driver and the navigator was, shall we say, involved colorful language and <laughs> could get testy at times. Yeah, I, I know a few couples that will not do it together. They'll have like a, you know, the their friend do it with them or something like that because yep. Yep. it's just safer. Yeah, exactly. It's, but so it was done done generally on a flat surface. It wasn't they call it obstacle, but it was usually a flat surface with cones. And it would be as simple as a, a solemn that you would go up and then come back, or it may involve sharper turns where you had to drive into like a parking area, like coned okay. off parking front way. And then you might have to back into another one somewhere else on the course. And then again, drive back to the finish line. Totally picturing something totally different. I'm oh. thinking, okay, or what are like, what hills are they going up? Like, how are no, you? No, like, no, <laughs> no. Wow, that is challenging. Okay. Yeah, that, so that, that, that a, a little bit of a safety hazard there because if somebody got a little over uh, rebunctious on the gas pedal and you're going off a hill with a drop off, you can yeah. easily, you know, fly it off. So, so most of the, the these fun events are always held on the flats just to make okay. them a waste safer and um it, it's not for to see how good you could get your vehicle over something it was to how you could interact with either another driver or another vehicle so so a real popular one was a stone boat and a stone boat comes from agriculture it's the, a farm-based deal it's a sledge built out of either timbers sometimes just tree trunks lashed together it would be hooked up to a horse or an oxen or, or pairs of horse and oxen. And they would load onto this sledge stones, rocks, or hay bales and drag them off the field or off to the edge so that they could get their plows up on it. So in the case of four-wheel drives, um, they would build a sledge. I think the one in Kamloops that they used was, again, using just tree trunks all lashed together and nailed together. On it would be placed a generally a smaller, lighter four-wheel drive, flat fender, four-cylinder, nothing really modified, just just something kind of light. Because the idea wasn't to, it wasn't like a, a tractor pull where you're actually trying to stop stuff. It didn't move like the weight on a tractor pull sled. It was stationary. Sometimes they would tie them down, but generally it wasn't violent enough that the vehicle couldn't just be in four-wheel drive low and, and, and with motor shut off, right? And so you would back your your truck in or your vehicle in, and they'd hook it up, and you'd see if you could move it. If you couldn't move it, then you're you're disqualified. If you could move it, it became a timed thing on how far you could pull it, a distance first, how far, and then they would set a, a generally a, a distance that you're trying to pull to. So it would be timed for distance, and then if you made a like a full pull, for a better explanation, you would be timed. I remember one time in. And, oh, and it was generally held on soft ground. 
So like the strip or, or soft, soft ground like that. I remember at Kamloops watching the stone boat. And, um, there was a guy with a, a short box, three quarter ton that he that probably built 390 automatic. He could move it at will. He was the winner. So people would try to pull, dig a little hole. He'd hook up, drag it a little farther down the track. I never competed in it because I just didn't have anything that I thought had enough grunt to actually do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there was at that particular race, a guy came out with a, a really hot Jeep, big, big block in it or whatever, built for drag racing, had, had paddle tires on and everything, hooked up, revved the crap out of everybody's running. No, no, no. Dropped the clutch and just went poof, into the ground. <laughs> just dug right down, eh? Just dug right down. <laughs> Yeah, the egg carry is another really interesting one that anybody can do, right? You can do it in a field or whatever. And you want to explain that one for us? Sure. So it it involves two vehicles, four competitors, a driver, a navigator, or a person in the passenger seat, and two plungers, preferably clean, like (laughs) toilet plungers, and, and an egg. That isn't hard boiled. It's an egg that could, if it's dropped or, or squeezed too hard, it's going to break. So you set up another slalom course, generally something where they have to turn the vehicles. They you line the vehicles up passenger side to passenger side. The plungers are put out. The egg is put in the middle and then it's go. So it goes in one direction. So one vehicle's going in forward. The other one vehicle's going in reverse and they're trying to turn around these cones when they get to the end of that they reverse so the the vehicle that was going forward now has to back up and the one that was going in reverse gets to go forward and so it it was again a timed event you drop the egg you dnf'd or if you squeeze too hard and broke the egg inside the plungers again it was a dnf so it was interesting to me a couple key points to doing that is that you want to use vehicles with kind of the same wheelbase. And it's better if the vehicles don't have doors. I mean, they can still be done with doors and the windows rolled down. It's just a little easier to lean out a little farther if you have to in a Jeep or a Bronco or, or whatever. Of course, you're wearing seatbelts, so you can only go so far. Mm-hmm. But it's another little fun event that gets people laughing and uh, pictures taken. And, Why? You know, yeah. these, these events are... You know, they're, they're fun events like the blindfold and the, and the egg carry and, and they're fun events that I would love to see brought back. Just even if it's just a group of friends having a, a fun day and they got a feel to go in. All the videos I've seen of them and all the pictures and, the, and my memories of them as a kid, they're such fun events that can be just a good laugh, right? So yep. Yep. I, I think it's, it's great. Now, the other one that I remember my mom talking about was where you had to hold a bucket or a glass of water. The passenger did. And yes. you go around the, the, the driver and you would go around an obstacle course kind of idea. And well, you had an actual course where there's jumps and raises and turns and bumps and, and all the rest of that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So you have to have that glass of water. Now, so I've seen various versions of it. You know, some of them, they have put it between your legs. Just as a joke, because you definitely don't want to spill any then, right? And, <laughs> and I've seen them where they've had to put it on the on the hood of a vehicle, but most times, if, I think it was the one person was was holding it. Oh, yeah. And my mom has talked often about this once when they're in Calgary, and they were going through the Bow River on the obstacle and doing this water glass or water bucket. I think at that one it was a water bucket. And as you're going through the river and uh, through the Bow River. And I guess dad forgot to put it in four wheel drive. So of course they get stuck. And so she just dumps it all water all over dad. Right. Little did they know that the local TV station was there filming that. So they were on the highlight reel for that night with her dump all the water over his head. But, but that's another fun event. There's lots of different events like that, that I've seen pictures of giant beach balls, you know, kind of idea right and you got to push that through a little core like through a chicane or whatever right mm-hmm. yep. I've, I've seen pictures of those in magazines i haven't seen it up here but there, there's lots of different funds events that people can do and uh, trisha i think something like that would be really neat to do with your gta jeep girls and yeah and uh, some fun events another one was the teeter-totter yeah the, the teeter-totter takes a little 
bit to set up because yep. you need fairly strong timbers to support the weight of whatever vehicle you might expect. So it could be up to a three quarter ton because unless you limit, you have to limit it for what materials you're using. You're just like, like it sounds like a teeter totter. It's these are put over a, a log, or even sometimes they build a special structure that will hold the timbers. They're in such a way that they can be moved for different widths of the vehicle. You start by getting the vehicle all four wheels on one side of the teeter totter. So the one end's touching the ground, the far side's up in the air. The when everything's calm, the starter goes start. And then you have, it's a timed event with the object to get the beams either totally balanced, or sometimes they would have a, a time frame that where both the front and the back of the timbers weren't touching the ground. So you could creep up enough and it would start going forward enough. And if you had it just going slowly, they, as soon as the, the back's the back end was off, they would share a, a stopwatch. And usually it was like 20 or 30 seconds, you know, quite some time. So if you were, it was, it was hard to control. It was hard to get them set, them level. And it was hard to control the totter or the teeter in such a way that you could beat the, the stopwatch. Again, lots of fun. She's, go up and started going too fast and, and they'd try to creep back and they would fall the, the back would re retouch again so that's your dnf so another interesting and a skill it looks easy but it takes a lot of skill and nerve to to be able to to get those timbers level yeah so it's basically yeah it's two two ramps it's not just you're not having to deal with one but you're actually having to deal with two two moving around and when i was at the national for all drive in burlington years ago we ended up building one for our, one of our open houses and it was the most popular thing there. And it's like you say, it's a skill. It's a true skill to try, you know, in, like you're not even an inch, you're like a quarter inch at a time just to make that perfect balance. Right. So it definitely, definitely a fun event for sure. Yep. Yep. The, so you mentioned some of the sidewinders that, that raced the, some of the Nanaimo sidewinders, you know, Greg Bird, Greg Fraser, Daryl Johnson, Rick and Bruce Morgan, and John Lees and Richard Rayner. I know Daryl Johnson still races with the Island Off-Road Racing Association in Port Bernie. He's got, he's got a few rigs actually. Yeah. yeah and he races south too. On yes. Some of the longer distance uh, yeah, races. Down the although he's, although he hasn't had too much luck trying to get down there the last couple of times he's. He's had the tow vehicle issues and I haven't talked to him since his last trip down. So I'm not sure how that went, but. Yeah. You know. He's usually got a few, few vehicles in the go and yep. he's, yeah, he's done some, some, some distance racing down South for sure. He's and, and Greg Bird. I mean, he, Greg raced his early Bronco for years. Yeah. And, um, and, and him and Fraser are the, they, they were actually, they built that together. They were, they were kind of nicknamed the Bor Borneo brothers. It was a, a, a Cleveland, a 351 Cleveland in it. And the uh, top loader Ford Speed out of a car, it flew. And I saw it when it was initially built. And then the progression from just the, the racer for fun days to uh, play days to the, the, the awesome off-road racer or distance racer that it, it, that it became, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And it's, I think Daryl has it now. I, I, I believe Daryl does still has it somewhere on his you know, property. Yeah, from um, my understanding, it's just sitting there. Yeah. Pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're great. Our uh, Bruce and uh, Rick, they raced a Bronco too, an early Bronco. It had a 351 Windsor in it. Interesting little factoid about that is that the cage that they they built started with the roll bar from my wrecked 73 because uh, the wreck got bought by a local wrecker down south. So, what was John Lee's and Richard Rayner racing? So, John had a early Land Cruiser. Soft top, full cage. I think he had it sl slightly modified to 600 in it. I think gas okay. ran a header and a, a Weber carb because you couldn't get an aftermarket manifold, but you get a Weber carb, carb to sit on the instead of the single barrel. And, and in actual fact, John, Richard, Daryl, Greg were all the original signatories on the Sidewinders oh. uh, Constitution and bylaw. And where I live in, in Imo, my next, uh, the house next door was Richard's. So 
and, and down the road going the other way was another original member. So they, Rick and Bruce, would take theirs. They were one of the two teams that went and raced the, the Boomerang 250, which we'll be discussing later. Yep. The other thing about John's Land Cruiser is that it's basically the base for the Sidewinder's little logo. Okay. They came up with Sidewinders. The, the, all the wives hated the name because they were thinking the snake. And what they did was they took a character of his Land Cruiser and put a key in the side of it. Sidewinder. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's where the name but, and the when, why it looks the way it, the, the logo looks the way it is. The little red truck with the, the, the gold key sticking out of the side of it. That and totally then make, that, I never, I never even thought of that. That totally yep, makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then Rick had a 76 or 77 short box step side 150 that he lightly raced. He, he would go in team relays a little bit, but the, the course had to be fairly flat because it was his family transportation right. and he didn't really want to beat the heck out of it. Right. But he did race it. He was in a couple of, of team relays when the club was here on the island racing yep. team. Yep. So, so on the island, you guys raced in, you know, Victoria, Duncan, Nanaimo, Parksville, Port Alberni, Campbell River. Yep. And then some of you guys went up to, as you mentioned earlier, Penticton and Kamloops. Quinnell. Quinnell. Yeah. I think they went, went, went to Quinnell. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I only went to Camus a couple of times. The Cornell trips and stuff were mostly before I was really in the club. Yeah. But I, I've seen pictures of them racing on the, and pit ticked and racing at the, the track and racing up, up the hills around it and coming back yep. on, down on the track. Yeah, and exactly. Sort of and then Mission, I mean, everybody knows Mission, Mission Raceway yep. for, the, for the drags or for the asphalt drags and the, the road course, but Mission back in the early days had some great racing down oh, there. They did. had sand drags, they had wheel-to-wheel yep. racing. Yep. There was a Barrel lot. racing, went to a couple yep. of a uh, couple of association hosted events there. Wheel-to-wheel, I, I raced in the wheel-to-wheel in the obstacle course and on, and all the, on strips. I got, I got great photographs of, of some of the stuff racing down that, that track. It was, a, it was a really fun place to go on. And race, and I'm a, a drag racer from way back, so it was cool <laughs> just to be there, right? The history and and yeah. all the rest of that sort of thing, right? So, yeah, I know. There's a couple of years they had some pretty big drag races, like some guys coming up from Oregon, California, and that yeah. for yeah. the racing there yeah. up Mission. So it was yeah. it was a pretty big event for a few years. Yeah, 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 running running like dual paddle tires on rails, and and yeah, yeah there was some pretty wild stuff. We passes down that in the dirt. Yeah, some pretty exotic stuff, yeah. and then. Stokes Pit in Surrey. I mean, oh, yeah. a lot of people, you know, don't even really know about that. But yeah, there was off-road racing in Surrey and yeah. it eventually, you know, did get shut down. But I've heard a lot of great stories about, about Stoke Pit. Yeah. Did you know that Ra- Roger Manson was a competition director in 1977 for the association? I didn't know that. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah. I, I've been talking to Roger, but oh, I, I didn't you? know that. Yeah. yeah. That was a ha- ha- hell of a rig guy. Pardon my language, heck of a rig. I, I, I was working the, the hill climb somewhere, either here on the island or the Kamloops. And that was even before he had the blower. He had that home uh, tunnel ramp thing with the big yeah. couple of fours on it. And he revved that thing to 10 grand and dropped the clutch. I couldn't believe really, the big monster attack. I couldn't believe he was revving it that high. And he just flew up that hill like it was nothing. And it's a, as a, it's a, just for our listeners that, that don't, re, you know, don't or haven't heard about Roger Manson, he drove this beautiful little Willys Jeep and yeah, he had a four cylinder Pontiac engine in it. And it's basically half of a 389, I think. I, I can't remember off the top I, of my I head. That's the dimension, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. So a little four cylinder engine. And, and as Rory mentioned, it kind of progressed through the years and started off stock and then a few modifications and then up into the dual four barrels on it. And then a supercharger on this little four-cylinder engine and then alcohol as well. And we're, we're talking early 80s, right? So this is all really high tech for that time period. And he would go over to Gravel Rama over in Ohio, which is probably one of the, the biggest sand drag and, and hill climb events in North America. And he'd win over there. Uh, and, and, uh, and what made that so special was that the hill was that pea gravel, which was super yeah. hard to get traction in, right? So. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty impressive. If you could get your truck over the top of that, you were somebody. 
Yeah, because it's shifting all the time. That peat, yeah. that gravel is just shifting and, and it's really hard to get traction moment, momentum. So, but yeah, Roger had a great, that, that, that little thing just flew. And it's so, from my, I, I don't really remember it much, but what I do remember is people talking about the sound of that yeah. four cylinder screaming at 10,000 RPM and, and yeah. dropping. Yeah. And, and there, there's some other, you know, in regards to sand drags, there's some really neat sand drag rigs over the year. Vic Gap with his Bronco. You yep. know, fiberglass bro- red Bronco and uh, the green machine, which yep. was a started off as a Ram charger. And I do want to get Bob on the show as well, but uh, he ended up building an aluminum body or, or stainless body with it and 440 with twin turbos. Yeah. And again, I we're going back it. in the late, yep. yeah, late 70s, yep. early 80s, right? And yep. twin turbos back in the early 80s was just nobody had heard of that kind of like that technology. Yep. And uh, it, was, it was quite interesting to look at some of the old vehicles and that. So I know some of the, you, you mentioned the boomerang 250 over on the island, which was around Parksville, I think, right? Yes. It, it was, yeah. it started in, in the Northwest Bay division of the Mackinac Blow. And there was a, a couple of pits very close to the gate. And it was about a 35, 32 to 35 mile loop that went out over kind of the, the hills or low mountains over to the other side took maybe a 300 yard run down the paved Nanaimo Lakes Road that was up close to where the lower, the first lake is. And then it would make a comeback on the other side and and come down the other thing and make a a turn at the bottom of the V and race back up. And I think it was like seven laps or something around that. Yeah. It was pretty tough. Yeah. It, and it's a couple of years, you know, I, I I do like collecting newspaper articles and other artifacts to help me learn about the history of off-road racing in Canada and that, and one of the years I saw that there's just a ton of rain one year and it just looked like a mud show. <laughs> Trisha would have loved it. I would have loved it. Favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that was the second year. We didn't, our club didn't really participate in it. We were in the first year. It was overcast. There was a bit of rain on the back side of the course a little bit, but um, it was more or less dry. Mm-hmm. There was enough moisture to keep the dust down, which was a good thing. But yeah. Yeah. It's it, all, all vehicles on at the same time, right? So it, it can get dusty in some of these longer races. Now yeah. let's talk about Roy Haslam. Roy. <laughs> he he uh, was an amazing racer, huge history in stock cars here on the island. And he did an amazing thing with the Suzuki. Yeah. Well, those races. So, a, a little Suzuki Samurai, it's actually the earlier version, but yeah. you know, same, basically the same size as a Suzuki Samurai, which, and it appeared stock other than this great big wing on top of it. Like, we're, we're talking a huge wing, things yes. massive, right? Yeah. And what does he do? There's all these other guys, you know, there, there's, there's Bob Nesty with his, you know, high dollar V8 rig that he's racing down in the, the mid 400. And there's some of the other guys like Greg Bird and Daryl Johnson Scott and, you know, Tommy Moore come down from Quinnell and that. So there's some guys running some very, very capable rigs. And what happens is two years in a row, Roy Haslam wins overall in a stock Suzuki. That that first year, there was a, a bunch of guys that came up from California with a brand new, but it's, I think, middle 80s, purposely built off-road racer. A guy down in California had built two of these and decided that he wanted to change class from that to class eight two wheel drive pickups. So both of those machines were a quarter of a million dollars each for to get them built. They bought it for a hundred grand, which is still a smoking deal, but a lot of money. Yeah. They drove up. These guys had nothing but money. They drove up, stopped in Vancouver, bought a complete mechanics set because they had no tools. So like rolling cabinets and everything, either snap on or craftsman or whatever, showed up all with those, all this bland, brand new stuff. And it was very impressive. It was lapping the field. It looked like it was going to win until I think lap four or five, they came in to do their pit stop, turned it off to do all of the, you know, fluid checks and everything like that. Went to go start it. The starter didn't work. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of some of aftermarket special kind of started to go with the art man transmission and all the rest of that stuff. So nobody in the pits had anything that would work. So that was it. The race was done. Greg and Greg 
they didn't finish. They knocked off a drain plug at the bottom of the of the rear end. They put up they had put up a drain plug in it, but it didn't cleanly break it off. There was still the magnet was still stuck in there, so they couldn't weld it. The magnet was messing up the weld. The right. the the, the leaking 90 weight out of it couldn't couldn't be sealed with any sealer or anything. So they were done. I think Rick and Bruce finished, but they were way behind because on one lap, they had two flaps, only one spare. So they finished over half of it on just a rim. Like, it, like they blew the, blew the desert dog off and then the rim, things I got pictures of is just kind of, they had to almost be beat off of the, the axle because it had been folded over so much. They needed, they had one more spare in the pits, and but they needed a, another one to go with them. So I had my bro- Bronco there, so I jacked it up and cautiously gave them one of my desert dogs. Thankfully, they didn't have to use it, so I got it back rather unscathed, but I was really worried <laughs> that it was going to come, the rim was going to come back looking like that. The first one that they, they brought back. So. Yeah, that, that's one of the things, you know, about racing some of these longer races is you got to finish to win. <laughs> that yeah. and anything can happen, right? Yep. It's and and at, at classic tortoise versus a bunch of hares, right? That's yep. where the boy was just out there plodding along, doing his <laughs> thirty-five miles an hour or whatever he was doing the yep. course with, and and just outlasted everybody's breakage. And, and there's some so many stupid things that can go wrong on a race like that. But you can have a fuse blow or there's been so many stupid things I've come across that can take you out of a race. And it's just like yeah. a, a 25 cent part, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, that, that occurs west in all, all sorts of racing. My brother works on blown alcohol stuff and both funny cars. And, and now he, he works on a, a double A altered out of Florida and just the dumbest thing could kill a run. Right. Yep. You know, it's, yeah, it's exactly. racing a lot, right? Yep. Exactly. And then even animals, you got to worry about animals out there, right? And cows and birds and. Yeah. Or <laughs> so. the, some of the stories that Greg came back with running down in the mint and that sort of thing, you would say you would be roaring along, you'd pre run the course, you'd be roaring along. And then all of a sudden there's a big pile of people standing somewhere. And he says, you knew exactly right then, you better get on the brakes because these idiots have dug a jump. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a common knew. thing down there. It is. Yeah. So, just so they can see somebody get big air and or crash. Yeah. 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 yeah for sure. So let's, let's bounce back to your vehicle. You had your race Bronco and then you picked up your, another F-250 in 1982. But let's talk about that parts Bronco that you bought in 1983. There's a story oh. behind that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there is. I, I had gone, was going to Calgary out to visit my brother. Sean. And uh, on the way out, I was searching for a Dana 44 for a Bronco to, with the plans of, of getting my Bronco back racing. Couldn't find any, any, any wrecking yard on the way out. Got out to Calgary, spent some time and in the, that their buy, sell and trade or whatever their local parts deal. There was a 1977 wreck that said it was rebuildable. So I gave him a call and arranged to, to go have a look at it. And it had been hit pretty hard in the left front corner, I think, or one of the, the cor- I, I think it had to be the left front corner. And uh, but it was so hard that it actually pushed the frame, the front of the frame over so far, it split both frame rails from uh, in front of the firewall for it. So, you know, I, I showed him that. I said, you know, this is, the frame is unrepairable. So at the very minimum, you got to try and find a frame. And, you know, they're, they're like hen's teeth trying to find one that hasn't been wrecked, you know, enough that that, that frame isn't damaged. So I said, would you be interested in selling parts? You know, I was thinking, oh, maybe I can get the front end out of it, possibly the engine and all of that. He said, well, well, let me think about that. Again, another great timing on my part. They were expecting their first child. I guess they were a little short of money. So he phoned me up and, and, and said, hey, would you give me a thousand bucks for the whole thing? Okay. So I went and got a tow truck and got it towed over to my brother's place in Calgary. And the original plan was that I was just going to, you know, take the motor and the front end, possibly steering box, but I was, just, I, I was, I suspected that it was probably damaged. And then I was just going to get my brother to cart it away to the, the crusher. 
after I'd cut the front sheet metal off and pulled the motor out of it, I had this kind of little, well, I'll admit it, brilliant idea of possibly getting a, a hitch welded onto the front of it, take the front suspension out of it, and drag the whole thing back as a trailer. And my brother came from home from work, and I dragged him out there, and I said, what do you think? He said, huh, I think it probably worked. He knew a couple of guys that were in the truck building and trailer building business, and he got one of them to come over and have a look, and we discussed it. And he said, yeah, no problem. You get, you get the rest of this stuff off the front end and stuff, and I, I can make this work. No problem at all. So sure enough, stripped it right down. So it was just the frame back to the rear end, the, from the firewall back to the, you know, with the cab or top and everything still on it. He came over did like he was really he was a professional put the uh tack the 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 hitch where he thought it was going to go measured from the hitch point to both sides of the rear end got it perfect like within probably quarter of an inch of of being the proper triangle welded her all up it was right at the 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 proper level as it would fit on the toe ball on the top of my step hitch rear step bumper so it was perfect i wired up the tail lights you know cut into the being an electrician with no, no problem do, figuring yep. out all of that out and uh, loaded the, the transmission and motor into the and transportation the back of my pickup. I think I put the rear end in the back of the, uh, the Bronco trailer now to kind of even the weight out and uh, headed for home. Almost lost it on the way home. I was getting into Banff and there was some sheep or goats on the side of the road. BC boy, got to stop and take pictures. And as I'm pulling up to, to take pictures, I feel this distinctive clunking, clunking from the rear end. Huh, that's not very good. Get out, look. And the ball that I hit, hit, hooked to, I never thought about checking to see how tight it was. And it had almost fallen, the bolt had almost fallen out. Wow. So <laughs> I, I, I limped into the, into bounce, into the parking lot for the train station and crawled underneath and, and tightened the bejesus out of it. And I never had a, a, a lick of problem on the way home. <laughs> never got bothered by, like, had a temporary permit on it and insurance. Never got bothered by any police. And I actually even stopped in Surrey on the way home for a four-wheel drive executive meeting. And there was a, a few comments like, who the hell owns that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So got it home and it sat in the backyard for a bit. And then plans changed. The family car we had decided it was just... Well, it was to a point where it was unsafe to drive. So I took the race Bronco totally apart, left the front clip on it, welded the 77 back half of the body to it, adapted the doors from the early Bronco to the later model body, which is a lot harder than it looks because although they are identical, the point of where it attaches to the, the catch is in two different places. It's three inches off between oh. years. So I had to reposition that, put the drivetrain in, painted it up, and it was our family vehicle for 10 years. <laughs> Used it in Jasper. It was our family vehicle out there. Let me tell you how cold a steel roof Bronco gets when it's 40 below. I froze bananas behind the seat on the way home from Calgary one trip. Um, and my kids were not happy and we had them dressed in, in warm stuff and they, they still weren't happy. So I ended up having to hang blankets around the back to keep the heat in. And after we did that, it was fine. But yeah, 40 <laughs> degree weather just sucks the heat out, whatever you're pumping in there. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter what it is. Right. So, and then, so you had that for quite a long time and then back in what, 93 or so you picked up a full size 78 Bronco. And that sounds like it was a pretty neat rig. Yeah, I had to experience, had another kid when I came back. So I was up to four. A little tight to get a, a family of six into an early Bronco. And so the, what I call the club truck became available. So this full-size Bronco started off with Greg Bur Fraser purchasing it. Brand new from Fog Motors in the lower mainland. It was a part of a canceled uh, fleet order, so he got a pretty good a pretty good deal on it. From what I understand, it was an XL, you know, no hardly any options in it. 
uh, except four wheel drive, right? The, the standard rubber floor mats and everything like that. So uh, he, uh, he, he bought it, started modifying it, came with a 351M in it, four speed, granny low gear. Not sure if it had four tens in it and probably not. They were probably three fives. But along the way, the, from that point, it progressed to a four inch lift kit getting installed. The 351 morphed into a 460 big block. Detroit rear locker, four tens in the back by Detroit two track in the front with 409s because that's the, the, the different or the, the gear set that the 440 or the, the 44 meets up with the 410. And yeah, it was a pretty capable beast. It would go pretty much wherever I had pointed it. And it had been owned by a, somebody who had been in the club. Each time was sold, somebody in the club would buy it. I think I was the, the, the fifth owner, and I think I bought it from Greg Bird. He had had it then. And he, I, I used it, four-wheeled the heck out of it, blew a Detroit up in it. The axle shattered right where it went into, a Detroit, into the, the rear differential. And yeah. split it apart. Never seen it, but it's from all the years of of banging away on the axle, it fatigued the end of it, and that was the the biggest, probably major repair I ever had to do with it. Yeah, I used it for camping trips, four wheeling. Used it for pushing sprint cars at the local racetrack, Cassidy Speedway, and down in Victoria. It was a great truck. I owned it for almost twenty years. Wow. It was a a great great truck. So, yeah, it sounds like a really neat rig. Yeah. And then, then you moved into your Dakota. Yeah, it, the, the the typical Ford it was slowly rusting away to a pile of stuff to a point where I didn't know if I was going to step, put my foot through the, the floorboards or whatever. So I, I put it up for sale, basically, just as parts. But an ex-club member, Jody High, he came over and had a look at it. Heard, somehow heard that I was trying to sell it. And I explained to him, hey, this is parts only. I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing anything. I got another Bronco in the backyard with parts. You're not welcome to both of them, but man, they're parts only. His son's a welder. He says, hey, I can fix this. Okay, okay whatever. I didn't, I gave a smoking deal on it. I just wanted to get all the stuff gone. There was a, at that time, there was a Dakota for sale in our neighborhood. Never really looked at it very, very closely because it was low. No indication that it was a full load drive. And it, so, and it was for sale for a long, a long period of time. So I thought, well, there's nothing wrong with this or whatever. And it's probably two wheel drive. My wife was delivering papers at the time, well, uh, kind of a biweekly thing. She went by and, and, and talked to the people and, and she said, hey, this is a four wheel drive. You know, really? So I went and looked at it. Sure enough, four wheel drive, but it was also a five speed. So he was having a hard time selling it because as soon as he would mention it was a standard click, you know what they say, millennium, <laughs> any theft device, nobody can drive, <laughs> he couldn't drive a standard anymore. Nope. So I went and took it for a drive. It had pretty low kilometers for the age. It had been kind of maintained okay. And so I bought it for three, three grand, immediately took it to our local spring shop, got them to rebuild the rear springs with a two inch lift in it, cranked up the torsion springs a couple inches. So it's now reasonably height, a reasonable height and I put 30 by 950 BFGs on it. And, and it's, it's and, great for what you're using for now, right? Yeah. You know, for yep. back roads and the, and the geocaching and, and stuff yep. like that, right? Exploring and then. It was our camping vehicle for a long time. We were yep. still tenting back then, so we'd lo we could load everything we needed in the back of that. And um, it, it, been, it went to Alberta a few times, and it was while we were driving when we were in Saskatchewan, we got pissed on and, 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 and stuff. So, yeah, it's been a great vehicle. I, I, I still enjoy it. It hasn't, through, through my career of v owning vehicles, it's been very, there's been very few years where I haven't had at least one. I might have had a, a hot car, but I'd still had a full ride. Yeah. So. Yeah. I should have asked Trisha, do you have the questions in front of you? I got sort of used to not, sort of used to not having a, another co-host. This is only <laughs> our second time we've done the co-host thing. So. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and no, the, the, hey. the first person was, was somebody that she knew. 
So yeah. it was a good, you know, bounce back and forth. But I, I have to apologize, Trisha. That, no, you know, no, 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 no. Don't apologize. It, I'm, I, I'm here. It's just like I'm <laughs> getting up all the history. This is awesome. No, no, no. Worries. No okay. Worries. Okay. I, I wasn't okay. sure there. So well, I'm okay. Um, okay. All right. So the Nanaimo Sidewinders, you mentioned off air that, you know, by the late 80s, they only a few guys are still racing in that. And the club, you know, returned to his day runs and camp outs and, and family stuff. We mentioned that the Nanaimo Sidewinders were involved in the Four Wheel Drives Association, you know, since 77 up into the, the late 90s. And you also mentioned a lot of the club members held various positions in the association. There's you know, Region 1 VP and Education Chairman, and Vice President, etc. So the Nanaimo Sidewinders were very involved in the Foral Drive Association of BC over the years. Yep. We, we actually even hosted a convention one year in Nanaimo. There was really only two or three of us that really carried the mantle or the torch for the club at the association level. We truly believe in their, in the, their, what they're trying to accomplish and and, you know, use the outdoors on a shared basis. And, and we don't want, to want access to everything, but we sure would like a little piece of the pie to share with, with other outdoor users. So a lot of club came and went pretty fast. I think in 1980, 82, there was maybe 51 clubs in the association, like 14 clubs here on the island. And it, it went up and down over the years to, and slowly as, as either clubs lost interest or the, the racing started dying off, especially in the, in the late days when, when money became such an issue, a lot of rigs just either got sold, parted out, trashed, crushed or whatever. So we, although we had a, a strong racing basis, we truly believed in the, the ideal of of getting outdoors, exploring roads, and sharing our, the space with other user groups. So in, in that time, I think Greg was the first one to really step into a position in, on the executive of the association. He held the Region 1 vice president, which is Region 1 being Vancouver Island. Region 2, I think, was Lower Mainland. 3 was getting up into Kamloops area. Yep. There was up at one point up to seven regions. I can't remember all of the locations. I held up the, I sat as the education chairman from 82 to about 85 when I, because of employment and the dead construction era of the time, I, I had to go into the, the ski industry to make a living and I got a job at Marmot Basin in Jasper. So I left the province for about two and a half years. The club still moved along. I, I think there's a possibility that Greg was a, a vice president of the association during that time period, but I can't, I can't 100% see for certain that, that it was. When I came back, really joined the club again, got right back into representing our club at the full drive association level. I held uh, the pos vis um, vice president for Region 1 for five, six years, wrote articles and columns for the back rotor, drew a couple of funny little cartoons for the back rotor. Yeah, it's, I truly believe in the, what the, they stand for. So the, the, the back rotor, for those listeners that don't know what that is, it's actually a magazine, I mean, that the Full Drive Association BC puts out. And... Back in those days, it was a smaller, you know, one I've seen lost from the 80s and that. But it has morphed into a beautiful, high-quality magazine. I don't know if you've seen the ones that come out in the last, you know, five, ten years. And they've been absolutely, you know, the pictures and the articles have been wonderful. And But it's all based on volunteers like yourself writing those, yeah. art, writing those yeah. articles, right? So. That's why it, it only comes out like once a year or once every two years right now, because it is all volunteer based. So, but yeah, kudos I, to you for, you know, supporting that. Cause yeah, even back then it was a problem producing it. It was, yeah. it was printed. The idea was to print it four times a year. And, and it was just, it was like pulling hen's teeth to try and get anybody to contribute anything. Right. It, it drove, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he was in the landscaper. He was the um, editor for quite a while. Like and John. It just, 
John, John some, yeah, oh, yeah, John something. I remember. Yep. He they would drive him nuts trying to get <laughs> enough stuff together to to produce produce something. So, and an organization like a club or a four wheel drive association is only as good as the volunteers that want to put their their the work into it. Right? It's really easy to sit at the back of the house and chuck, you know what, and not do anything. Right? It takes dedication and and a will to to step up and and put your two cents in or pull the rope as it were for to move the organization forward right so yeah definitely and it's really made some big gains you know for for a while it was the numbers were low in that but i think as social media came on board it really helped the association gain interest from other people and gain exposure and yeah, and it's sure. really growing in the last you know 5 10 years it's just really growing yeah. and so now we're starting to see a lot more you know, a lot more interest and a lot more work being done around the province, right? Oh, yeah. Like it's, there, there's work being, there, we have rec sites up in the, up in the north and there's, there's talk about them opening up some new, or other rec sites on the island and the fire lookouts and all that. So, yep. it, but it's all volunteers. Right? Yep. So, yep. so speaking of volunteers, you represented the four-wheel drive association on the island for a few land use planning inquiries. One of them was the Namint Valley Watershed. Yeah. What was that all about? So it's the Namint. Namint, okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the area has been prominent recently on the news. You've seen pictures of that drone footage of the uh, of that big avalanche that came rolling down the mountain. Yes. That's, okay. that's the Namint Mountain. It's, it's up a little side channel kind of of the Alberta Inlet. As you head out to the west coast, about halfway down that, that that valley in there, initially it was just a small little land use inquiry and input wanted put out by the Port Alberni Forest District Office. So some small meetings, the association asked me to attend. I made a, a couple of presentations, just saying that then no, there's, we don't want any special access. We don't want you to cut down and make huge roll, roads for us. But we ask that in consideration when you do have roads, don't just automatically, you know, block them off again. Consider multiple uses other than just hiking in the uh, stuff that's left behind. So it was it was pretty quick and easy, and and uh, I made an impression with the the office there. They were they thanked me for for giving them the pamphlets and the stuff that I presented to them. So. Yep, the input, yeah. Yep. And then the other one, like, I guess we should almost maybe mention before we get into the other one that for those that don't know, Vancouver Island is a lot of the southern island is owned by private wood or private companies. And so there's not a lot of crown land really left on the south of Vancouver Island. And when you think about it, Vancouver Island is actually quite a big area you know it's it's a very very big island and for the bottom half to be no crown land is and it's there's a lot of gates so unfortunately that's something that you guys are dealing with over in the island the the second thing that you're involved with was the commission on resource and environment from 92 to 94 what was your involvement in that and what was it about so so that was a, a lot that was a big actually job, a lot of meetings and that sort of thing. It was the idea of the government at the time to try and get all of the interested user groups, be it industrial, recreational, um, general public, and come up with a plan to designate how the island would be protected or used in industrial purposes and all the rest of that sort of thing. Very political. It was around around the time that the Carmana was was, which is a for those that don't know, Carmana Valley is a an old growth part of the island that was under pressure to be logged, and they the what the commonly referred to as WC Square, the Western <laughs> Committee in the Wilderness, whatever they they fought really hard to to stop the logging. They went about. It, in a bit of a sneaky manner on expanding their their base 
they were starting to take tours of bus tours out to to show the camera and show what what could be lost. I have no problem with that. What they were doing though is when you paid your fifteen bucks for the bus ride, you became a member, whether you knew it or not. <laughs> So they went from 3,000 members to 30,000 members more or less overnight. And they sure, knew how, they sure knew how to make the, to use the media. So we, they approached me, the association approached me again to attend this. I ended up in the recreational sector, which is where, you know, our interests are. Could not get, I was the only mechanized user group in this sector. Couldn't get the... Mountain bikers interested in attending, couldn't get the snowmobilers interested in attending. So here I am sitting in the sector with hikers, biologists, you know, plant people, kayakers, sea kayakers. I was not, shall we say, welcomed in, in the group. So not only was I trying to, you know, put input into this whole thing, I was having to have interesting discussions with people of my own user group, which sometimes cause some rather nasty sectorial meeting because, because they, they had no use for anybody. They, they, they look down at somebody who wants to mechanically use the outdoors as the big, bad boogie map. And they take that as far as mountain bikers or any other user group that uses something that has anything other than your two feet to move you. So uh, it took a, a lot of input and pushing from my side to at least even get some acknowledgement that we had a right to be out there too. Yeah, It went on for two years, lots of input. Some of the board meetings, the, the roundtable meetings were unbelievably contained, you know, rough and the WC squared were really good at quickly grabbing them, the reporters when there was something said that they could get a, a gotcha on from a, <laughs> a, a user group or whatever. Yeah, and It was definitely an interesting experience to see how the politics of the environment work. I suspect that they may be a little bit better now, but they're not far from what I witnessed during those two years. After all of that work, lots of production of pamphlets and big books and everything like that, nothing was really accomplished. They just, it just kind of slowly petered off into the, the sunset, as it were. The getting back to the land use here on the southern part of the island, the history there is that it's the, it's called the ENN land grant because it was given to the big coal baron at the time. Part of the constitution, or the, not constitution, but the origins of Canada were that they were going to produce a, build a railway from St. John's all the way to Victoria. So, and, and to get membership of BC, they guaranteed that they would get a railroad bear, built on Vancouver Island. A couple of place companies tried to do it. They went belly up. The government approached the, the name, excuse me, the the big coal baron here, and they just started throwing land at him until he finally said, okay, I'll build it. They were willing, from what I read, to give him the whole island, but thankfully he only took a third of it. And this is going back into the late 1800s, kind of. Oh, yeah, right? the, beginning, yeah. the beginning of Canada, right? Yeah. So yeah. it was a decision made politically because from where they stand stood, the politicians that they were trying to create a country. Yeah. They, they couldn't foresee the difficulties that it would cause. And even today, the, the land is starting to turn from, from forest land to they're selling it to produce housing and stuff on it. So they got this land for basically a dime per acre, and these companies are going to benefit from selling it off. It, it's just, it's an unfortunate thing about, you know, living in a country, right? There's decisions will be made that will not sit well into the future. And it's, you, you just can't, you can't look into a crystal ball far enough ahead to, to see what a decision could or could not. 
Yeah, helping. especially when you're talking, you know, 100 years in the future or 50 years in the future, they're they're not seeing seeing that, right? So, yeah. and even today, with things that are happening today, they're, it's going to affect things that are you know 100 years in the future for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. even the things that I've seen change on the island in my lifetime, right? And probably in the places that you was well, you've been in, you you can see things that make you go flimp. Yeah, definitely. So the last question that we ask our guests is what what Canadian would you like to listen to in a four before Canada podcast? Honestly, I I have given this a lot of thought. I can't really come up with I'd like to hear Daryl and, and his son on on their long distance racing. But I'm not yeah. sure if Daryl has the makeup to do that. He's kind of a quiet guy. Yeah. Definitely. I'm really looking forward to Roger Manson. Yes. Him and I have had some really good conversations on the phone, and I think that's going to be a really neat one. And we can talk about his four-cylinder wheelies and his, you know, Bonneville sat salt flat days. Right? Yeah, and, and, and drag down, racing. So. He 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 yeah. raced. He 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 took that motor and put it in the same vehicle that he salt right, flat raced in, and took it to yeah. the mission. He was pretty fast on the yeah. asphalt too. So yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, Rory, I think we're going to wrap it up here. I really appreciate you coming on board. And Trisha, I know you're three hours behind or three hours ahead of us. So it's late over where you are. So really appreciate you sticking around with us tonight. And I know I asked most of the questions tonight, but I, I know you've got some really neat guests coming on board in the future in the next you know, two, three weeks. We've got some really interesting people coming out of Ontario. And I'm really looking forward to some of your your interviews with these with these folks. So thank you, Trisha, for staying up late tonight. <laughs> and Rory, that was a incredible conversation. That was that was so much fun. I yeah. I really, really enjoyed that. And okay. you know, it brought back some memories for me and and people are really gonna be interested in what you had to say, everything from the racing to the brawl goes to the to the association stuff. And I I think there's a lot of people are really gonna be interested in that. So I love history. I love, you know, whether it's, you know, your history or my history or Trisha's history or anybody's history. I love learning about people and their lives and, mm -hmm. and what they've done. And I really want to thank you for coming on tonight. And it was, I just want to say I had a, absolutely loved it. And I want to take the opportunity to thank both of you for having me. Like you, Wes, this has opened up a lot of memories. It made me dig through a lot of pictures that I haven't seen, really <laughs> taken time to look at for a while. Trish, I'm sure he sh he's going to allow you someday. To I, 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 I kind of overran the conversation tonight. I'm no, sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> well, but, it was but, like, yeah, I think coming, like just being, I think, more like millennial, more newer in the off-roading and just like hearing all your history and just the history of just off-running in general it's just like, like i'm in awe and just yeah i just learned a lot and i really really enjoyed it and thank you like just thank Good. you for meeting you and just getting all that knowledge it was amazing yeah totally and, awesome. I gave, and i gave you that little bug about geocaching too so i <laughs> I, I accomplished something too yes yes <laughs> so yeah. so once again rory really appreciate coming on board it's been been a lot of fun and hopefully, you know, next time I come over in the island, we'll go grab a coffee or beer and, yeah, you and continue the conversation. I look forward, I look forward to that. For yeah, sure. Awesome. Beautiful. Thanks again, everybody. Really appreciate it.